Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Emma. I'm the program manager at Reef Asylum Support, um, and we're really excited to be uh, hosting this webinar today on uh, the recent changes to the work permit application process for asylum seekers. Um, two sets of changes will go into effect in August, uh, and that'll be the focus of Angela's presentation today. Before I introduce uh, Angela, I want to uh, introduce two other members of the REEF team who are on the call, uh, Marcus and uh, Tanzilia. Marcus, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, so my name is Marcus. I uh, am a volunteer at REEF. And I'm here today to help for uh, the French translation. So if you have any question, if you don't understand what's going on, please, uh, you can write a message in French if you need, and I'll do the translation for you. Great. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, and Tanzalia, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Hi, hello. Um, I'm Tanzilia. I'm here to help with the Russian language support. If anybody's, I'm not sure, like, do we need Russian? If yes, just say something in the chat. Otherwise, I'll be posting some main points in, in Russian language in the chat box. Great. Thank you both. Um, so to reiterate, we will provide French and Russian translation in the chat function. If you want um, that help, just go ahead and say in the chat now so that we know there are people um, looking for those translations. Before I introduce Angela, um, I'd like to cover a couple logistics. Uh, the presentation is going to last until 1230. We're going to begin with a presentation uh, by Angela. And then uh, we'll do a question and answer session at the end where you'll be able to answer, ask your own questions. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please write them in the chat box and I'll, I'll keep track of what you guys are saying and can consolidate that into a couple questions um, before we kick off the Q&A. During the presentation, please make sure your microphone is muted. Um, and if you can, please turn off your video. We have a lot of people on the call, so to make sure that it's not too much bandwidth, um, we want to try to keep videos off. During the Q&A, you're welcome to turn your video back on and to unmute yourself to be able to engage in the conversation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Angela. Angela's uh, a immigration attorney with her own uh, private practice and a longtime member of Reef's legal team. Uh, Angela, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Emma, for this opportunity to talk about these changes. Um, so this is actually my first webinar via Zoom. So um, if there are any um, technical difficulties, please forgive me. And I'm sure that we'll be able to kind of uh, work together in making this presentation somewhat, um, you know, uh, I guess technically uh, you know, flawless. <laughs> so I will start now. Um, and as Emma said, um, please hold your questions at the end. Um, we will be discussing two specific regulatory changes. So, you, um, so your questions might be answered throughout the presentation. Okay, so I will start. Um, I will start now. Great. So, um, so yeah, so basically, um, so basically I will be talking about the two new regulatory changes. Um, the first one is the, it's called the removal of the 30 day processing provision for asylum applicant related form I-765. Um, and this was released the, the 22nd of June. Um, and this is set to be effective on um, August 21st. And the second one is, uh, the title is Asylum Application Interview and Employment Authorization for Applicants, released on the 26th of June, effective on the 25th of August. So after the discussion of specific points um, about these regulations, we'll, we'll briefly talk about some takeaways and then after that, we will um, uh, answer some questions. Okay, so what are the new regulations? So as I said, there are two new regulations and they're, they were both instituted in June of this year and set to go in effect in August. 
Okay, so the first one, um, basically it's the removal of the 30 day processing provision for asylum um, related form um, employment I-765 employment authorization applications. So this will take um, an effect on August 21st, 2020. Um, and basically it eliminates the 30 day adjudication requirement for initial filings. And it removes the requirement that asylum applicants submit their work authorization renewal requests to USCIS 90 days before the expiration of their current employment authorization. Okay. Okay, so the first one, the first provision that we're gonna talk about is the elimination of the 30 day adjudication requirement for initial filings. So as I mentioned, this will take effect on August 21st, 2020. So what does this mean? So this means that effective August 21st, on or after August 21st, there will no longer be a 30 day mandated processing time for initial work permits. So if you have um, already applied for asylum and are eligible to apply for your initial work permit before the effective date, you should file your application before the effective date of August 21st. So you will be grandfathered under the current rule. So currently, before the effective date of this provision, of this regulation, you are able to apply for a work permit if you have filed for asylum and it has been over 150 days and there is no decision yet on your application. Um, USCIS has an additional 30 days before they can approve your application for a total of 180 days waiting period. So this is commonly known as the 180 day asylum EAD clock. So just a brief overview of the asylum clock because you know this is um, a little bit of a confusing concept for, um, for people. So I'd like to briefly discuss this so that we have a framework to think about um, how this will affect um, individuals um, applying for a work permit. So the 180 day asylum EAD clock measures the time period during which an asylum application has been pending with USCIS or with immigration. So as I mentioned earlier, under current regulations, asylum applicants must wait 150 days um, from the date that their application was received either at immigration court or at USCIS before they can file this form I-765, which is the application for employment authorization. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier, USCIS cannot grant employment authorization for an additional 30 days. So you have a total 180 days uh, waiting period. So it's important to note that this 180 day asylum EAD clock does not include any delays that um, may be caused by the applicants. Um, if they request um, some additional time or if they, um, if they cause their applications to be, um, to be, uh, to be pen, to, to have additional pending time with uh, the asylum office or with immigration court. So the clock starts when the asylum office receives the form I-589 or when this I-589 is filed in immigration court. So as I said, the clock can stop um, due to any delays caused by applicants. So the clock stops, um, for example, what, if the applicant um, transfers the case because they move to another, um, another jurisdiction. So with that, the application is transferred to another asylum office. Or for example, they had asked to reschedule their interview date 
um, they failed to appear for biometric for their biometrics appointment. Or, for example, if in immigration court, um, the court um, grants a continuance or another or another hearing for the applicant to obtain an attorney, or if the attorney asks for more time to prepare for the case. So basically, the asylum clock stops um, when the applicant um, requests um, some additional time for the application. So these are just some uh, examples of when the asylum clock can stop. Okay, so the next provision in this first regulation is the elimination of the 90-day requirement for renewal request. So this is also effective August 21 of this year. So this is the good news, right? So um, the good news is that now asylum applicants can, um, can actually apply before the 90 before the days, before the expiration of their current employment authorization. So this means that starting the effective date, August 21st, asylum applicants can now file the renewal work authorization applications up to 180 days before the expiration date. So this would be about six months before your um, employment authorization document expires. So this minimizes any potential gaps in employment authorization. Um, Okay. All right. So now this is um, now this this is the second um, regulation that was released in June. So this is called Asylum Application Interview and Employment Authorization for Applicants. Um, so this is effective August twenty fifth, twenty twenty, and this eliminates. Uh, these are just some of the few things that um, that have come up with this new regulation. So these are some of the changes. Um, first, it eliminates the 180-day asylum clock. So starting August 25th, asylum applicants will now have to wait 365 days from the date that their asylum application was received before they will be eligible to apply for work authorization. Um, with, with this regulatory change, it also restricts asylum applicants who fail to file their asylum application within one year of their last arrival in the United States. So basically, this means that if you did not meet the one-year deadline, you won't be eligible to apply for work authorization. Um, this second regulatory change also uh, prevents um, individuals with um, a conviction of an aggravated felony, um, a particularly serious crime, or a serious non-political crime outside of the United States, and other similar um, convictions from being eligible to apply for work authorization. So it also eliminates recommended approvals. This second regulatory change also automatically terminates employment authorization, including um, the automatic extension of employment authorization when the applicant's asylum denial is final. Um, and also, this prevents um, foreign um, nationals who cross the border or entered without a visa from obtaining employment authorization based on a pending application if they are unable to show good cause for their illegal entry. So this, this specific regulation is very overarching, right? So basically, it's it's really um, kind of put in place a lot of hurdles and obstacles for asylum applicants to get uh, to be eligible for work authorization. And so for the next few slides, I will be discussing um, some of these points. Um, 
so that we can kind of understand um, how to navigate um, in this new kind of um, landscape. All right, so this is, I'll be discussing some of these changes. Um, and these, this, the second regulatory change, as I said, will be taking effect on August 25th, 2020. All right, so the first um, provision that I'd like to discuss is the elimination of the 180 day asylum clock. So with um, starting August 25th, um, asylum applicants will now have to wait one year from the date that they will, uh, that they have filed their asylum application to be eligible to apply for work authorization. Okay, um, I just want to check uh, to make sure that I'm not missing any um, kind of chats that I need to um, one moment. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, sorry. So I'm going to resume now. So, so as I said, this second, the second regulatory change has this provision that uh, eliminates the 180 day asylum clock. So now asylum applicants will have to wait 365 days or a year from the date that their asylum application was received before they will be eligible to apply for work authorization. So who will be affected by this change? So asylum applicants who are filing for their first work permit application. So this new rule will apply to anyone um, who has not accrued 150 days on their clock before the effective date of August 25th. So if you've already filed for asylum and your 150 days will run out before August 25th, you should file your initial work permit application before this date. However, if you are waiting to file for your work permit and your 150 day period will run out on or after August 25th, um, unfortunately, you will have to wait um, one year from the date that your application is received um, before you may apply for your work permit. So um, I know this is, this is a huge change and um, you, you know, uh, immigration advocates have talked about how this, you know, will likely cause and do hardship to um, asylum applicants who are already in vulnerable situations. So we are expecting some legal challenges um, for uh, to 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 counter this uh, this new regulation. However, at this time, this is the landscape that we're in. So we just have to kind of go with, um, with what's presented to us. And uh, later on, I'll have some you know, takeaways on how to kind of uh, manage this in your application. Um, I've also put here an example. An example is if, for example, Jane um, had filed for asylum and it was received by immigration on February 3rd. Um, her 150 day period will end on August 1st. So this means that she will be grandfathered under the old rules. Um, however, anyone whose application was received on or after um, March 28, which is 150 days before the effective date of the new rule would be subject to the new rules and they will have to wait one year from filing, um, one year from filing their asylum application to be eligible for work authorization. Okay, so the next provision that I'd like to discuss um, about the second regulatory change that will take effect on August 25th uh, is uh, that it restricts asylum applicants who fail to file their asylum application within one year. 
So basically, those who did not file before asylum, before the one year deadline, um, will, be, will be restricted from applying for um, work authorization um, and until um, an officer or a judge finds that there is a one year filing deadline exception. So, um, you know, currently we really don't know how this will be adjudicated, but according to the regulations, um, this uh, once uh, either an officer or a judge um, determines that there is a one year filing deadline exception, that will be the time that uh, the applicant will be able to apply for work authorization. So this is that we're assuming that this will happen at the time of the interview or at the time of the hearing, which means that the, ap the applicant won't be able to be eligible for, uh, to apply for work authorization until that time. So who will be affected? Um, asylum applicants, uh, you know, as I said, who do not meet the one year deadline. So even if you have and can show a clear extraordinary or changed circumstances exception, you, you will be restricted from applying until um, an officer or judge determines that you do have, um, you do have, uh, determines that you do have uh, a filing exception due to extraordinary or changed circumstances. Um, so an example of this is, um, for example, John, who is an asylum applicant, arrives in the U.S. on August 1st last year. So he files for asylum in 2020, and the application is received by USCIS on August 25th. So this means that John um, missed his one-year deadline. Because John filed for asylum after his one-year deadline, and it was received at USCIS on the effective date of the rule, he will not be eligible to apply for his work authorization until an adjudicator finds an exception at his interviewer hearing. Okay. So this, um, the third provision that I'd like to discuss um, concerning the second regulatory change that will be effective August 25th, um, 2020, is um, that uh, asylum seekers with certain criminal convictions will be barred for, uh, from applying for uh, work authorization. So this new change bars applicants who are convicted of an aggravated felony, a particularly serious crime, or if they committed a serious non-political crime outside of the United States um, and other related um, crimes from being eligible to apply for work authorization. So with this, um, asylum applicants with aggravated felony convictions at any time, at any time, will not be eligible for work authorization. However, those with convictions for particularly serious crimes and serious non-political crimes, where the conviction or offense occurred on or after August 25th, 2020, um, will be prevented from applying for work authorization. So an example is uh, Maria. Maria arrived in the U.S. on August 1st, 2019. So on January 1st, she was convicted of a she was convicted of a theft offense, which is considered to be an aggravated felony. After that, she applies for asylum, which was received by USCIS on March 28, 2020, before her one-year deadline. Um, and then her 150 period, 150-day clock will expire on August 25th. So this, 
makes her ineligible to apply for work authorization due to her aggravated felony. So even if she filed timely, um, because of her aggravated felony, um, she will be ineligible to apply for work authorization. Okay, so um, the next provision that I would like to discuss um, concerning the second regulatory change that will take effect on August 25th is the restriction for those who entered without inspection from receiving asylum EADs, asylum work permits. So this new change prevents non-citizens who cross the border or entered without a visa from obtaining employment authorization based on their pending asylum application if they are unable to show good cause for entering without inspection. So this affects um, those who entered through the border. So it prevents anyone who entered without inspection on or after August 25th from receiving an asylum related work permit. So this will not apply to renewals of EADs for individuals, EADs meaning work permits, for individuals who entered without inspection before the effective date of August 25th. So there are, the, the new regulation provides for limited exceptions for those who sought asylum at the border and, um, and presented themselves to an immig immigration officer or a CBP officer and can show that they will be, they can show that they will, they fear persecution if they were returned to their country of origin and can show good cause for having um, entered without a visa or across the border. Okay, so our example is Marius crossed the border to enter the United States on August 25th. So this is, he entered um, during, at the time of the effective date and he was app apprehended by border patrol. He told the officers that he would like to seek asylum in the United States if Marius can demonstrate good cause for entering without a visa through the border, he may be eligible to apply for work authorization. Again, you know, as with anything in immigration um, and, you know, specifically asylum, um, each case is um, reviewed on um, an individual basis. So something that um, applies to an individual may not necessarily apply to um, other people. So uh, that's something to, to know. Okay, before we move on, I just wanna check to see if there are um, anything on the chat. Okay, so I know that it's, um, it, it must be quite overwhelming, um, you know, kind of, you know, hearing about all these new changes um, that are set to take effect in August. So I'd like to take this moment to, um, to discuss some takeaways, some um, for, um, for us to kind of remember. So the first one is that, um, you know, if you are eligible to apply for work authorization before the effective dates of the new regulations, you should do so, right? So that you, you would be grandfathered under the old rules. Um, something also that I've noticed a lot with asylum applications is that um, applicants, you know, cause delays in their asylum clock um, without, you know, intending to. So you have to be careful about causing any delays. So you want to make sure that you comply with all the requirements. So if you're, for example, if you're applying 
you know, if you've applied for by yourself, if you're applying, you know, by yourself, you have to make sure that you um, read the instructions on the application forms and make sure that you comply, um, you know, to each of the requirements, right? So even something as, you know, even something as, um, you know, small as submitting, you know, kind of supplemental documents, right? Less than 14 calendar days before your asylum interview may be considered a delay that's caused by you. So this could stop the clock and this could prevent you from applying for employment authorization. Um, you know, on a, on a sooner, sooner rather than later. So make sure that um, if you're thinking of applying for asylum, um, make sure you file before the one year deadline. Um, also, um, you want to ensure that you provide the required and supporting documents for your work permit application to avoid any delays, any requests for evidence or um, any, um, anything that can potentially um, delay the decision or, um, or subject your application to further scrutiny. So as I mentioned, um, you know, these, because of the overarching nature of these regulations, especially the second regulatory change that'll take effect on August 25th, um, it, it's likely to be challenged in court. So, um, you know, this is, you know, right now, this is what we're looking to, right? Like this is, you know, in August, this will be, the situation that we'll be dealing with. But at the same time, right, it's always important to stay positive and not lose hope. So I think that's the most important thing that we should always be thinking about, no matter what the situation is, that, you know, we just have to keep our positive outlook because, um, you know, there are always um, advocates there who are um, you know, willing to challenge any overreaching by the government. So if we keep a positive outlook and kind of think about, you know, problem solving and how to kind of present your case in the best way possible, then I think that, you know, it should, um, you know, kind of have a positive, um, positive uh, result. Um, and also, I think, you know, something to think about, um, you know, although, you know, the asylum application process was originally designed to, so that the individual applicant can actually file for their application themselves, they, they don't necessarily need an attorney to do these, right? But it's always recommended to seek the help of an immigration attorney, especially if you have any, um, you know, particular issues that um, may make you ineligible. So um, it's also, I also want to say that there are many um, individuals out there who hold themselves out as immigration practitioners, um, such as notarios or paralegals who are not lawyers. And I've seen cases where um, the application is just not, um, you know, properly completed or, um, you know, not well documented. And so that's something to think about in terms of, you know, when you're applying for asylum is to make sure that you, you seek the right um, advice. Um, I think I think I have finished with the presentation, and um, I guess uh, Emma, we can start the questions. Thank you uh, so much, Angela, for the presentation. Um, it was full of so much information, and as you mentioned, it's it's a lot. And so let's um, let's dive directly. Uh, directly into questions. I wanna raise one that's come up a couple times in the chat, and then I'm gonna open it up to the group for you to ask your own questions. Uh, Angela, could you talk a bit about 
these changes in the context of COVID-19. So for example, if um, someone missed a deadline or if they, um, if their asylum clock stopped as a result of something related to COVID-19, what recourse do they have? So yes, yeah, so currently um, USCIS um, has a policy in kind of being more flexible in terms of uh, delays that are COVID related. So if, um, if for any reason the delay is COVID related, then you should actually explain that in your application. So um, I think in these types of applications, it's always um, recommended that you spell out one, any kind of um, requests that you, you want. So for example, if you failed to file timely, then you would explain this is because you know COVID and specific and specify what exactly happened. Um, I think you know if you think about like so many people are you know kind of affected by COVID. So if the asylum or uh, immigration officer sees an explanation that is more specific and really explains their situation rather than just having a general explanation, oh because of COVID, right? what exactly happened, right? And this kind of explanation and, or elaboration is, you know, I think at this time very much necessary in terms of anything that you think will be a red flag or be a question by uh, an immigration or asylum officer. Um, so it's always just good to kind of explain. Um, you can have a separate sheet explaining any issues or in your statement, explain any issues, right? So um, it's always good to, you know, present these issues off the bat and kind of offer the explanation rather than having them kind of come back to you and, you know, ask, right? Great, thank you, Angela. Um, we have lots of questions coming into the chat. I'm gonna um, call on a couple of you to ask your questions. Before I do that, uh, I just wanna point out that we do, uh, at Reef, we, uh, we have a, we have a program uh, to connect people applying for work permits with trained navigators who can help you do some of these pieces. Um, so if you're in a situation where you're uh, something was delayed as a result of COVID and you want to write one of those explanations, uh, one of our navigators can help you do that. Um, you can find the sign up for that on our website. Uh, so to turn it over to questions, um, Arena, I see you have a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it? Can I can find myself, Arena Brick. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and ask your question. Yes, I applied for work authorization first May, and USKS had received my application on uh, on 11 May. Uh, what kind of regulation when I can receive my work permit after this new regulation? Do you know about this? Yes, so Irina, if I understand what your your you had submitted in May, so this is before the effective date of the regulation. So you will be one of the individuals who would be grandfathered under the uh, under the current rules. So the old rules would be applied in your situation. So. Um, you should be, um, they should be processing your um, application within the 90 day period. Um, so that's, that should be what's going to happen, right? Sorry, um, Angela, you say 90 days, right? 90 days? The... Yeah, so basically she would still be um, grandfathered under the old rule. So anyone, anyone who applies, for work authorization before August 25th, this is for the initial work authorization, will still be grandfathered under the old rule. 
So if you, um, if you apply, if you are eligible to apply before August uh, 25th, you should do so, so that the old rules will apply in your case. But if you, let's say, if you're not eligible to apply before August 25th, unfortunately, you're, you know, you won't be grandfathered under the old rules. And at this, you know, at that point, you know, if there's no legal challenges, then you will be subject to the uh, new rules. Um, also, um, Emma, I had I had looked at the the questions that were posed before, so I have some I have some here. Um, if I can just uh, I guess answer them. Yeah, go ahead and do that, and then we'll get back to chat questions okay. after. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so basically, um, some of the questions where uh, one of the questions was. Um, about whether um, whether employers um, can only hire U.S. citizens and permanent residents if there's some discrimination there. So basically, there are certain jobs, particularly government jobs, that are restricted to U.S. citizens and permanent residents only. Um, but generally, if you have a work permit and an employer refuses to hire you or interview you because you do not have a green card or you are not a citizen, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> then this employer's conduct, <coughs> excuse me, may, uh, may be unlawful and you can report it to either um, the immigrant either the Immigrant and Employee Rights section or the Equal um, Employment um, Opportunity Commission. So it, you know, it depends on the employee and on, on the specific employer, but you can certainly um, file a discrimination lawsuit if that occurs to you. Um, and then another question that I saw is, um, will fee waivers still be available? So yes, um, as, as of now, fee waivers remain available. So that's um, something that they haven't done away with. Um, also, there was a question about the EAD validity. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it may be issued up to two years, um, but you know, this may be, they may also um, restrict that to less than two years. Great. Are those the... Yeah, I think those were the, the, the questions. Awesome. Um, we'll get back to the questions coming in through the chat. Um, but just to clarify, um, one person has asked, uh, where and how can you explain lateness due to COVID-19? Where and how? So um, I guess where would be uh, if you're filing an application, right? So if for example, um, if this is your, your first time applying for asylum, then you would either put it in a separate sheet of paper explaining everything or um, in your statement. But let's say you're applying for work authorization. Um, on the last page of the work authorization application, there's space there to explain. So you can use that to explain um, you know, any of the issues that are on your application. Um, but certainly you can always use a separate sheet of paper, a cover letter to explain any of, um, you know, any of these. And what was the second part of that question, uh, Emma? It was where and how, I think. Where and how. Yeah, so I think, uh, I hope I answered that. Um, I think really the, you know, the explanation is very case specific, right? Like. As I mentioned earlier, you want to be more, uh, you want to elaborate specifically on what happened to you in your specific case, rather than kind of have just a general um, request for consideration because of COVID-19. You know, I think, you know, it's less helpful to say like, oh, please excuse the lateness due to COVID-19, um, rather than kind of having um, 
a specific explanation. Um, a specific explanation, for example, would be I was sick with COVID-19 and I have now just recovered. And so please excuse the lateness. So something like that. And just to reiterate, if anybody is preparing a statement explaining lateness as a result of COVID-19, please reach out to us because we can help you frame uh, we can help you frame that statement so that it's it, as effective as it can be. That's um, returning to the chat, um, Peter St. Louis, you've asked a question. Do you want to pose it for the group? Okay, we'll skip over for now. Um, Martin um, Salas, I see you've asked a couple questions. Um, would you like to raise a few of those? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have three questions. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, so the first one I had was just uh, about the criminal offenses that were expanded, whether or not you mentioned, um, unless I missed it, you mentioned that there are crimes that were taking place outside of the US. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I'm assuming, does it apply to crimes within the U.S. and its territories? Yes, yeah, so I'll answer your first, this first question. So basically, the criminal offenses that they talk about, so specifically was aggravated felony. So um, in, in immigration, they've used this term aggravated felony to actually kind of cover a large group of offenses that one may not even be felonies or two may actually not be considered aggravated but they're actually just kind of putting all of that um, in one category so that's the main thing that any at any time either before august 25th or after august 25th if you have committed something that's considered that uh, aggravated felony and I believe aggravated felony is a term that's specifically for the U.S., right? Um, so if, if, if you were convicted with an aggravated felony at any time, then that bars you, right, for, uh, from obtaining employment authorization. However, the other two that they mentioned is um, particularly serious crime or... Um, or serious non-political crime outside of the country. So these two, they're only looking at any convictions after the effective date of August 25th. So for these two, these could be um, considered crimes that are outside the country. So if it's a serious political crime, you know, this usually um, affects a lot of like political asylum um, applica applicants. Um, you know, because basically a lot of asylum applicants, political asylum applicants, they're um, detained, they're arrested for their political participation. So this would be something that, you know, would be, would be a barrier, would be a, a, a hurdle for, um, for asylum applicants to kind of face. So, you know, unfortunately that, that is the, the landscape that we're kind of in. Um, and yeah, it's unfortunate. And this is just another um, obstacle, you know, that it's placed in front of asylum seekers to kind of make the process harder for them. Right. And you had two more questions, you said? Yeah, my second question is um, for those, just to clarify on EAD relief no longer being available to those who enter like without inspection, without being paroled. Um, does that apply to those who entered before August 25th? So like if somebody entered, no, so if, if somebody entered today, they would still be eligible 365 days from now, I guess. Um, so apply. basically, so basically the regulations say that anyone who entered the border without a visa or entered without being inspected will, after August 25th, will be restricted from applying for um, work authorization. Okay, so for, I just wanted to clarify. Yes, so basically for people that, you know, if, if you cross the border before then, um, or then present yourself for inspection, then you should not be barred, um, you know, if you apply at that after. 
Right, right. Which would be in, in 365 days, assuming that the rules are still in effect. Yes. And my third and final question is um, with regards to um, delays caused by the applicant, um, you mentioned that a, and I did read this when I read, you know, like the table at the end of the reg, uh, at the new rules, um, that um, if you submit evidence less than 14 days before an asylum interview, that's a delay, but there's, you know, the asylum office that I've practiced in a lot, obviously Beth Page in Long Island has a policy that they allow evidence to be submitted up until the day of the asylum interview. So um, can you address that? Do you know if that's still going to cause a delay and, or be considered a delay? Yeah, so I mean, you know, as I said, we really don't know how this will be implemented in practice. Um, and, you know, so far, yeah, you know, before, before August, right, um, before COVID, um, the asylum offices have been very um, receptive to accepting um, evidence until the day of the interview. And so I think, um, you know, hopefully, you know, because there is, you know, uh, immigration applications are still discretionary. Hopefully, like um, officers will exercise their discretion um, on the positive, positively uh, for asylum applicants. So we really don't know how this will be implemented, um, but hopefully, what we're hoping for is that you know the officer will use their discretion positively, and um, there will be legal challenges. So yeah, unfortunately, we don't really know how this will be um, implemented yet, but you know, I'm glad that you know, we have these opportunities to kind of discuss these changes so that we can prepare the community what to expect, um, expect I guess, to expect this worst case scenario right now. I'm just gonna go off um, briefly on off video. Um, just technical difficulties. <laughs> thank you so much for answering my questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, and thank you, Angela. Uh, Ruslan, you asked uh, two questions. Uh, would you like to raise them now? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what what's the meaning of the recommended approval uh, for the work permit? I mean, what's the, what's the meaning of that term? And right. the second and the second question. I'm sorry if I missed the answer about the fee waiver. Does it still apply okay, for the low for the low income um, immigrants? Right. So, Ruslan, right? So, uh, Ruslan, um, the recommended approval. So, currently, um, in a, uh, you, uh, asylum officers um, issue what's called recommended approval. So, this is kind of an interim decision by asylum officers that says, okay, you know, we think you qualify for asylum, um, but we're not issuing the approval yet because we're still. Um, you're, we're still doing some background checks. So that's, you know, generally what recommended approvals are. And uh, before, you know, when you get a recommended approval, you can actually apply for uh, a work permit, right, based on your asylum application. Um, with this new regulation, what they're doing is they want to take away, do away with the recommended approvals so that, you um, you'll have to wait until the decision is final on your asylum application or that it's officially granted before you can apply for, um, for asylum. Um, so I think, you know, one thing I think what we want to think about or um, the one way to think about these regulatory changes is that these are mechanisms for, um, for the government to kind of limit the ability of asylum seekers from um, getting work authorization. And why is that, right? The reason that they give is that to prevent, um, you know, fraud. And this has always been kind of an overarching theme, you know, in the asylum, um, in, in, in the asylum sphere, right? You know, this is, you know, they want to prevent fraud, right? Because 
you know, before, I guess, like, you know, it is their, um, uh, they've determined that, you know, the system is rife with fraud, right? But what I think is being missed, right, by the government is that, you know, unfortunately, at the same time, we're, you know, we're not protecting the vulnerable populations, right? So, you know, it, you know, right now, if you have a recommended approval, you can apply for work authorization. So this means that you're actually, you know, on your way to, um, you know, kind of having your second shot at life here in the U.S. You know, you do qualify for asylum. So, you know, you're, this is the start of your life here. Um, but now they want to do away with this, uh, which is unfortunate, right? So your second question was about fee waivers. Um, as I mentioned, this new regulation does not mention anything about doing away with fee waivers. So currently fee waivers remain available. Thank you. Um, Peter, would you like to pose your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. My, did you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, my question is, um, I will have uh, 150 days on 26th of July, and due to the to the COVID-19, the clock is stopped and back to 20 days until now. What can I do? Can I apply for work permit? Oh, what can I do? Okay, um, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand your question, Peter. Um, what I think, you know, because I think that's something specifically maybe about your case. So I think maybe Emma, maybe we could like schedule uh, an individual. So if you have something individual, like questions like Peter about your clock and stuff, maybe we can talk in a you know, individual settings so we can kind of discuss specifically, you know, what happened and maybe determine, um, you know, what's the best course of action. Would that be okay? Okay. No problem. Hello? Hello? Peter? Hello? Hello? Yes, I am a case null. My question is, a, I apply for a asylum a, on Apple. What a kind of rule a, a, I supposed to a, be a submitted? Okay, Chris Nall. So, um, so it. So I believe your question is that you had applied for asylum in April. Yeah. And you you want to know what to expect, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So you know because you applied in April, with um your 150 days would be likely after August 25th. So you would be subjected to the new rule, which means that you won't be able to apply for employment authorization until a year from April. Can you repeat for me? If I understand, I am submitted to the new rule. Yeah, yes, Chris Null. So for anyone who applied uh, or uh, for anyone whose application was received by USCIS um, March 28th onwards, um, you would be subject to the new rule, which means that you will have to wait one year for, um, uh, from the date that your application is received to be able to apply for work authorization. Mm, okay, thank you. Do, uh, okay. I must do uh, to wait uh, uh, one year to apply for a work permit. Currently, I mean, as of August twenty fifth, yes. Um, but you know, things may change, so you have to, you know, you have to keep up to date with what's uh, changed and also RIF can provide any updates if they're, you know, with, with this regulation. Um, so I also want to take this opportunity to, um, to say to, you know, anyone who has questions specifically about their case or kind of the asylum clock, I know it's very confusing. 
especially with COVID and like what, you know, what caused any delays. So please, um, please contact um, Emma to set up um, a, a consultation with us so we can talk to you about specifically about your case. Um, so because basically here we're just discussing general um, questions and we may not be able to specifically answer um, your questions, but we can do that at a, in a more private setting. I've put my email in the chat. So um, everyone who has these types of questions that are very specific to their circumstances, please send me an email and I can follow up by connecting you with um, Angela or Amir, who's the other immigration attorney on our team. I'd like uh, to raise Lexi's question. Lexi, if you're still on the call, do you want to pose it yourself? Sure. My question is essentially what received means when you just said whenever USIS receives the application. As you know, the Vermont Service Center is turning back a lot of applications for things like not having NA in every box and other ridiculous reasons. So is received when it is first sent and then returned or is received when you actually get the receipt uh, notice and, and tracking number? Yes, exactly. So the re thanks, Lexi, for that great question. Um, and, you know, this has been happening, right, to a lot of people, they're getting, you know, their applications returned for something minor and sometimes for, for something that's not even, um, you know, that's not even an issue. So the receipt date would be the date on your receipt notice, because that's something that you can, you show. For example, if there's some, um, you know, that's generally what the receipt date would be, right? Um, it's on your receipt notice, receipt, receipt day. Um, if Lexi, for example, if you have some, um, you know, specific kind of issue in terms of, you know, maybe the asylum office, um, some bad, you know, doing something in bad faith, that's something to kind of, you know, I guess, advocate on behalf of yourself or your client in terms of when it was received, right? So you would have to kind of, you know, submit some documentation as to when it was received. Um, but generally it would be the receipt date on the receipt notice. Okay, so you're out of luck if it was sent in first before the, um, you know, March date that would be 150 days before um, generally, I would, I, I would try, like, if, for example, it's not my fault, it's like some, if, it, if there was a fault by, by them or, um, by the post office, I would try to advocate and have documentation, um, to kind of, uh, support your claim. Um, but if it's something that, you know, is the fault of the applicant, um, and, or cannot be, supported by any documentation, then unfortunately you would have to use the date on the receipt uh, notice. But as, as I said, there's always room for advocacy, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lexi. Um, a couple people have asked this question, so let me raise it. How many days before a current work permit expires can you or should you apply for a renewal? So currently it's 90 days, right? It's 90 days before your current EAD expires. And you can actually, it can be, so in order to be, um, to be included in what's called the automatic um, work permit um, extension, you have to have applied for your work permit before the date of your work permit application. So, um, so let's say now, right now, your work permit is expiring next week, right? In order for you to be covered under this automatic work permit application, you must have, um, your application must have received by USCIS before the expiration date of your work permit. So if you do that, then your work permit or your work authorization is automatically extended for 180 days. So as long as you file for your work permit renewal, 
before the expiration date of the work permit. So it must be received there before the expiration date of your work permit then you're automatically, uh, your work authorization is automatically extended to 180 days. So this means that even if you don't receive your, you know, obviously there's massive delays right now. So your um, work permit will likely not be granted until after your work permit expires. So you're still work authorized, you're still authorized for employment 180 days after the expiration date of your work permit as long as you've timely filed for the renewal before the expiration date of your work permit. Um, Kokua has a, a related question, I think. If you're still on the call, do you want to raise it? Yes, I'm still here. Hi. Go ahead yeah. and ask. Hi, Kokua. Hi. Uh, please, I was asking like someone whose uh, uh, working permit is about to expire and we did the renewal before the closing down. But as of now, it's been delayed and I've been asked to stay home until I get a new one before resuming work. Is that right? So Kokua, from, from uh, what I understand, your question is that you have applied for your work permit before yes. the expiration date. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. The renewal. Great. Great. Did you get a receipt notice for the we renewal? Did. You did? Yeah, the, we did not get the receipt as of now. Oh, you haven't received it yet. Yeah. When, did you, when did you file it? Hmm. I think at least we did it a month, I believe, because it was done through the attorney, my attorney. Yeah. So you should ask your attorney to follow up um, with either um, the, 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 the mailing, uh, the uh, post office to see what happened, because if it's been a month, you know, it's, it's kind of a long time to kind of wait. Um, but still, you know, it, with COVID, there's, you know, there's been massive delays. So if you're working with an attorney, what I would suggest is really kind of talk to him about how do we follow up to make sure that we get this, right? That, okay. um, yeah, and, and you do have time to kind of, if you have to file another one, um, you do have time before August 25th. But in order to take advantage of the automatic um, work authorization extension, it must be filed or received there before the expiration date, okay? Yes, yes. Okay, great. It, it was done, really. It was done and I'm still communicating with the attorney. They, they are also still uh, doing the following up to the uh, office, but only that uh, I haven't received, they haven't also received any receipt from there. Mm -hmm but my employer asked me to get that renewed before. But let me put this thing to record. You know, I was having my driving license, which was also expired at the same time of the working permit. But that one has been renewed without any problem. I have the license right now, but Great. the working permit is not yet done. Yeah, so unfortunately, I, you know, I've seen that in other cases where, um, you know, People have filed, you know, a month ago and they still haven't received their um, receipt notices. So um, there has been many delays in terms of uh, post office deliveries. Um, so, it, but, but I'm glad that you are in touch with your lawyer. So we make sure that you keep um, working with him to make sure that your, um, you know, they follow through with your application. Thank you very much. Much. Okay, thank, thank you. I really you. appreciate it. I see a couple people have raised their hands, but before we get to you, I want to pose a question that's come up a few times in the chat. For people who are going to become eligible to apply for a work permit after the new rules take effect on August 25th, so they'll have to wait the 365 days, after they apply for their work permit, 
after the 365 day waiting period, how long should they expect to wait to receive their work permit? So I guess if you could frame it this way as well, Angela, for someone who's applying for asylum now, how long in months, years, should they anticipate it will take to receive a work permit? Right. So, so yeah, that, that's a great question that, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a specific answer. What I can say is, um, you know, kind of just like a general framework estimate, right? So if you won't be eligible to file before August 25th, right? You will, so one, you will have to wait one year before you can file for um for work permit and if let's say at that point the regulations are still in place so you've waited one year and now uscis also does not have the the mandated um 90 days to um to grant your work permit right so you know, under the, under the new regulations, you could be waiting for a while, right? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, this is kind of the, you know, the, the asylum landscape. Like so many people have been waiting for so long for one to get interviewed and now to get their work permits. So, I, I feel and I believe that there will be legal challenges because this, these new regulations are really causing so much hardship to um, vulnerable people who really need, you know, work permits, right? So unfortunately, I don't have um, a definitive answer for that. I wish I had. And, you know, you know a, a lot of these things are very much, you know, politically um, kind of determined. And so, you know, this is what we have to, uh, this is the landscape that we have to, that we find ourselves in. And so, um, yeah, it's unfortunate that we, we can't give people um, definitive answers um, because, um, yeah, unfortunately we can't. There's really just no mechanism unless we work at immigration and maybe they don't even because of the backlog so yeah um i want to raise one more question before we turn to those of you with your hands raised in the chat um if someone has a work permit angela do you recommend that they apply for an iti9 number um does that reflect better on their asylum application so basically, if you have a work permit, um, with the work permit application, um, with the current work permit application, you can also apply for a social security number. So you can do that at the same time. So it's really not necessary to apply for an ITIN because the work permit application process currently allows for the person to request for a social security card at the same time. Um, assuming that you didn't do that, that you actually, you know, just applied for a work permit and you now have a work permit, you can actually go to the social security office or um, I guess not, not go personally, but you know, you can actually look into how you would be able to apply for a social security number at this time. Um, because that is proof that you're a eligible to work here and that you can get um, a social security card and number. I also want to take this moment to underscore that if you um, are work authorized and for some reason do not yet have a social security number, it is worth it to apply, especially in the context of COVID much of the government assistance that's available as a result of the pandemic is available to people who have social security numbers. Um, and so as soon as you're work authorized, a first step is to make sure you get that social security number, just in case you need to access that government assistance, um, you know, in, in the months ahead. And I'm glad that you brought that up, Emma, because something that I want to reiterate um, to all asylum applicants, all asylum seekers, 
that if you qualify for public benefits here, you should take advantage of that because you're eligible, if you're eligible, right? So this public charge, um, you know, regulation that the, the Trump administration had instituted recently, this does not affect refugees and asylum seekers. So if you do qualify for any benefit, as Emma mentioned, you should, you should um, ask for that. You should apply for that, right? Um, you know, something to say is that not everyone is eligible for all types of you know, benefits, right? Um, but there are specific benefits that are geared towards helping asylum seekers. So if you do qualify for that, you should uh, apply. Oh, I see your hand has been raised for a while, so I'll get to you next, but just one last thing to raise. Um, a couple people have mentioned in the chat um, how difficult it is, the 365 day waiting period it's not feasible for most of us not to work for a whole year. Um, and, and at Reef, we definitely recognize that. It's, it's such a frustrating rule. Um, but let me pose a question to Angela. For people who are waiting that 365 day period and maybe still working informally, uh, do you advise that they get an I-10 um, to pay taxes? Um, I know this intersects with some of the new proposed rules that haven't gone into effect yet as well about working informally. So what I, what I, um, what I recommend to, you know, people who are working without authorization right now is if they are able to, to pay taxes at, you know, at any point, if you are working and able to pay taxes, you should do so because you know you're you're showing that you you know what your obligations are and that you're complying so if the way to do that is you know getting an item um and paying taxes through that yes you should do that but you should speak with an accountant regarding you know what you know what the requirements are um in that the regard great thanks angela um, and I'll turn to you, Al. Are you still on the line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for waiting uh, so I can ask your question. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to take a moment to thank every one of you for the time and for, for, for this presentation. And uh, I would like to ask, how does the new rule will impact people who have already uh, their working permit and have social security? Thank, thanks, Al, for waiting and for your question. So it, it won't really affect them unless they're renewing their applications, right? So, so basically um, now the, the new regulations have done away with the 90 day, I'm sorry, with the, with the limited 90 day period before your expiration, before the expiration date of your EAD. So if you are renewing your work permit, you may now file your application 180 days before the expiration date of your employment authorization document. So basically this allows for, um, you know, to, to minimize any gaps in employment um, so that you'll hopefully be able, you know, you'll be able to continue kind of working, you know, with, with the correct documentation. Great, thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you for, for your time and for, the, for answering the question, thanks. Thank you. I think this is a great, that was kind of a summarizing question that we can end on. We're approaching 1230. I wanna take a minute um, to thank Angela. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation and for taking the time to answer each of these questions. Um, I think we pulled out a lot of the impact of the new regulations through this question and answer session. For anyone who still has general questions, or if you have a question that's specific to your case and would like to do a legal consultation um, to get more information, please send me an email. I've put my email in the chat. It's emma at reefnyc.org. You can find it on our website as well. I'm the person who emailed you uh, the Zoom link. 
Uh, so please, please get in touch if you have any more questions. Um, we do have our navigators providing assistance of submitting work permit applications. So if you're preparing a work permit application right now and anything about it is confusing, and it's a confusing form, just email me and we can connect you with a navigator who can help make sure you're filling out each of the questions correctly. Um, with that, thank you everybody so much for attending. Uh, we hope it was useful uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you and stay positive everyone. And I think that's all I can say at this point. Thank you. Thanks Angela. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good day.